Спасибо за ожидание. Прошу прощения, у нас тут а, аж две сегодня видеозаписи, поэтому а, пришлось потратить какое-то время на подготовку. Ну и заодно те, кто опаздывал, получили возможность а, добежать. Я, пожалуй, а... Джеки немного... Нет, немного Джеки достаточно хорошо говорит по-русски, но а, я думаю, что мы все равно сейчас перейдем на английский, так удобнее слайды и доклад в общем-то адаптировать. Хотя я думаю, что потом, когда приходят для вопросов, можно будет переключаться. So, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you Jackie Kerr, our uh, researcher, visitor. So Jackie is finishing her PhD in uh, Georgetown University and she is doing studies on internet regulation among other things. So she did before uh, she got master in political science. Uh, area studies actually, regional studies, former Soviet region. Right, right. Uh, East Europe and Russia mm -hmm. some other countries. And also she has a bachelor in math, both from Stanford University. So she worked as a research fellow at the Berkman Center got numerous uh, awards and different grants, etc., etc., published several papers. So I expect a very interesting presentation today, and uh, I just give you a jacket, please. Thanks, Sergey. Um, can I stand in a place where I'm uh, not blocking the slides for everyone? That's fine. Okay, um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is sort of my first foray into talking to folks here about what I'm researching. I just got to Moscow two weeks ago, I guess two weeks ago today, and so I've just been getting set up. Um, I am, as Sergey said, working on my uh, doctorate at Georgetown in political science. And um, for anyone who hasn't gotten one of these, I, uh, these handouts, um, they just uh, have some of the charts that are in the slides, so um, might be useful so that if something goes past quickly, you can look at it. Um, so, um, what I wanted to talk to you today about was, let's see if I can get this right down, Here's the next one, okay, um, is that, uh, two questions, basically, and I've highlighted one of them because I'll spend most of the time on that. Um, these are basically the two major themes that I'm researching. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, this question of how is the internet or the developing use of ICTs, growing penetration of information and communication technologies in our societies, transforming how people um, get involved civically and how protest movements emerge. And particularly, why do we see such variation in, you know, on one hand, one country will have a major protest movement and another country won't have much of anything when you already have a fairly high degree of internet use and ICT penetration. The second question is looking then at something that I think is relevant to answering the first. Why are different countries taking different approaches to regulating the internet? So, um, as we all are familiar at this point following the news over the last few years, there's been a lot of discussion of the role of these technologies and uh, social media, um, smartphones, and anything built on the internet as a platform in transforming how people engage civically, and in particular in galvanizing protest movements. A lot of this in countries that are not completely democratic regimes, and where there's a lot of political grievance, um, whether it's about elections that seem not to be quite so, or whether it's about socioeconomic conditions. But you see protests in a lot of countries that are, um, by any measure, full democracies as well. So it's a phenomenon everywhere. And the question that um, emerges is, you know, are these fundamentally transforming the relationship between state and society? Famous political scientist in the U.S., actually at my alma mater, Stanford, uh, Larry Diamond, uh, wrote this article he t titled Liberation Technologies. He jumped on the bandwagon after the Arab Spring. and. Um, Oh, it's sort of describing how he thought these technologies were changing everything, revolutionizing civil society and uh, protest. And um, then there's been a whole literature that's emerged 
arguing against that, saying, well, maybe not, there's all these problems, but it's sort of been stuck in this back and forth between cyber um, utopians, or idealists, so-called, and cyber realists. By the way, I should say, before I go any further, I talk fast, and I'm talking to an audience where English isn't your native language, and I'd be in much more pain if I were speaking in Russian, so if there's anything I say that you don't get, please stop me, this is, in spite of the camera, um, small group, so we can make this as informal as is comfortable. Um, but, yeah, so you have here two examples you're probably familiar with. Um, this one is from where I worked uh, a couple summers ago at the Berkman Center. It's a research center at Harvard that has done studies of different linguistic blogospheres. And they've mapped the um, public affairs section of the Russian blogosphere uh, by both the network structure and the topics people are discussing using sort of computational linguistics techniques. And um, so you see that in Russia you have this vibrant blogosphere that's been emerging, but you don't need this to tell you guys that. And then this is a uh, Golos map of the election violations from uh, 2011 and 2012. Um, now, um, if these really are, quote, liberation technologies, then the argument goes that they play these significant roles in allowing people to engage civically and politically in ways that they haven't previously, or in way in different, to a different level than they've been able to previously. Through techniques such as the formation of groups and association, you have a place where people aren't necessarily going out and joining groups that much in their day-to-day -day life in the real world, but they join a group online, and suddenly you have this uh, development of a more networked society in which people are communicating about political issues. You have the development of public discourse online, uh, transformation of the media sphere and sharing of information that goes beyond what's available in the offline news sources. Um, even things like IT entrepreneurship can play a role, where you have IT entrepreneurs intentionally creating social entrepreneurship platforms, um, like the Usha Hadi platform, which if I'm not mistaken was used to build the Golos map, um, which is a crowdsourcing platform for use for such purposes. Um, activism and protest mobilization can emerge out of all these things. Uh, and there there have been a variety of mechanisms discussed for how, you know, in what particular ways does the ability for protest movements to emerge get changed. Discussion of things like technological affordances. Um, you can have reduced costs of participation, reduced costs of uh, organizing. You can, uh, because you can do things just online that you used to need miles of paperwork and stacks of orders and you need to go door to door and now you can just push a button and you also have non-co-presence requirements. Instead of having to fly across the country to meet with people you're organizing something with, you can be having a meeting by Skype, or you can be participating in the same protest action at different times of day, at di in different places. Um, mechanisms such as homophily or sorting, which in um, the U.S., there's been a lot of discussion of this causing balkanization of the blogosphere. People just talking to people who have the same ideas as they do, and as that being a negative. In a setting in which people don't know a lot of people who have the same grievances as they do, can play a major role in helping people organize protest. Um, so, just an example from my research. Um, one thing I didn't mention in getting started, I, I've previously done field research in Kazakhstan last summer, and one of the things I was looking at was this um, strike in Chanowazin, which occurred um, in the, um, through the year in 2011 for seven months and ended in December when it was raided by local security forces and um, fired on the crowd and um, there were at least 18 dead, rumor had it many more. Um, the official state report was that um, the reason that the crowd was fired on were the police were overwhelmed and they were defending themselves from the crowd that attacked them. But the pictures which went up on YouTube, the videos that were posted by, from people's balconies, showed police chasing and shooting at the backs of unarmed civilians running from them. And uh, this obviously transformed the national discussion of what had just happened. And this spread virally extremely quickly. The government didn't know what to do and had to sort of backpedal. Um, 
So this is an example of how something that happens in a remote part of a country, way far away from the major cities, can have a tremendous effect and lead to protest movements in Almaty, in Astana, in the major cities of the country. Uh, so you had a, a Nisiglasnia Kazakhstana movement in Almaty. There were five or six major protest rallies. At first they were a couple thousand people each, but with time they dwindled and diminished. There were arrests of people and by the end it was just a couple hundred people or a hundred people coming out. Uh, which shows the other side of this, which is that context matters. So when I went back to Octal, uh, to Jeanne was in in Octal in the summer of 2012, it had been a half a year or getting to be a year since some of these events had happened. And the people we spoke to basically said, nothing's happened. Yes, there were all these bloggers who came and wrote about us and journalists who wrote online media reports. But in the end of the day, uh, we, we, we still have missing loved ones and we don't know what we can do to get our back pay. And it's still the same grievances we had before the strike. And meanwhile, there was a trial going on in Octal where the government was going after the very um, media um, resources that had been used to publicize the events. So it doesn't always lead to liberation, even if these are called liberation technologies by some. Um, and this leads me to the other part of my research, which is looking at what, what really is deciding at the end of the day where these technologies are going to have the most benefit and where they aren't. One of the factors I think is going to play a really important role is the ways in which the government responds, the sorts of regulations that are chosen, and to what extent that clamps down on effectively the use of the technologies by the public for these sorts of mobilization and activism purposes. Um, and another thing is the, relation, the way that relates to the overall regime type could play a major role. Now I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, just to give you sort of a compressed 20 year history in one slide, um, the internet used to be thought of as unregulatable. Um, in the, I don't know how many of, of you guys would uh, remember this, I vaguely, vaguely, vaguely do, but in the early 90s you had people talking about how the internet basically couldn't be regulated at all. That it was a, um, uh, the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. This was John Perry Gilmore, who is the, uh, one of the co-founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, major um, NGO in the U.S. that protects civil liberties online. And um, he also was a lyricist for The Grateful Dead, which explains his capacity for great one-liners. But um, he turned out to be a little bit wrong here. And as time has shown, you had in the late 90s, um, people starting to discuss the fact that really it has to do with the infrastructure that you're built, building. Um, Larry Lessig at Stanford was writing about code is law, what, how you regulate it. Uh, it's not just about the laws you write, it's also about the code you write. You can create a system in which it's more closed and less open. And by now, um, you have a lot of discussion of different states having different sorts of ways of regulating the internet. And there's lots of different means at their disposal. Um, example from Uzbekistan. Uh, this is the nice page that pops up to greet you if there's a page you visited that supposedly is, has pornography. Um, now, these sorts of things are sometimes used to block things that don't have pornography. Um, this is my favorite. I lived in Qatar for a year um, and I was greeted by this fellow a couple of times. I figure if you're going to block sites on the internet, this is the way to do it. Um, at least it's a friendly demeanor or something. Um, but it, I got this in response to trying to find a political blog once, so I know this wasn't just for pornography. Um, generally, there's an expanding list of different approaches being used for um, restricting internet access, internet content, and the rights of users. Um, one differentiation that's been used a lot for describing this is first generation versus next generation approaches. First generation is the stuff I just showed you. It's stuff like blocking pages, blocking pages so people know they're blocked, so it says this is blocked, or just blocking them so they are wars and wars for an hour and you don't know why the site's not loaded. Um, but there's 
a lot of other techniques too, things like um, complete shutdowns of the internet uh, in a moment of crisis, or of the cellular network, uh, or creation of walled garden intranets in a country like in North Korea, or like Iran is trying to do now. Um, next generation techniques tend to be a little more subtle than that. Tend to be things like legal restrictions, things like you're defining everything online as media, or things, and then you're applying the same rules that are restrictive offline to everything people post, people post online. Um, things like going uh, behind closed doors to internet service providers and saying, will you please take down that site? Uh, and putting sort of behind the scenes pressure extra legally. Things like just-in-time blocking or otherwise known as denial of service, DDoS attacks, uh, where it's plausibly deniable. No one knows exactly where it's coming from, but a major site goes down, that a major opposition site goes down on election day, for example. Surveillance physical attacks on bloggers. There's various sorts of techniques that are used. One thing these have in common generally though is that they don't have the effect of completely blocking people's ability to access material. It's temporary, it's creating fear, things like that. But if people are de really determined to get at that information, they might be able to. If they're really determined to uh, get in contact with that person, they might be able to. So it's a little different. Yeah, Sergey. It's possible to interrupt you, right? Of course. Perfect. You've just shown it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How do you define what is first and what is next? I mean, some of these things I would be, you know, it's having fuzzy. hard time to to decide where to put it because some of the things of next generation were used before, or just. And I, I, I confess, in making this slide, I compress some things in that. Um, some places it's referred to as first versus next. Some places it's referred to as first, second, third, fourth. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's some arbitrariness to these fuzzy distinctions. Um, if you're interested in getting at sort of how that has been set up as a way of dividing, the, the folks at the uh, Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto who work collaboratively with the Berkman folks actually uh, have come up with this sort of way of categorizing. And I'm not sure I even agree with them on every categorization, but I think it's useful as a heuristic for thinking about this. It's, um, there are some things that are obvious. Site blocking, you can't get at the site, or maybe if you're really good with VPNs, you can. But stuff like a physical attack on a blogger, it's bad, but it doesn't block any internet site. Um, does that but sort I, of... That also kind of happened before. I mean, I understand the first generation and next, it's just... Oh, you're thinking of it in terms of chronology. Okay, so that's the other thing, is Russia, and to some extent the whole former Soviet region, has been seen as an exemplar of these next generation approaches. Whereas there are a lot of countries that have applied these much more than they've applied these and are just getting around to trying some of these out now. Uh, so, you know, you have countries where they've given every internet service provider in the country a software that blocks a list of key, anything that contains a list of keywords and uh, any site that's on a particular blacklist and everyone applies that uniformly, but they haven't done any of the more sophisticated or nuanced sort of approaches until more recently. So that would be sort of the difference. It, the chronology is messed up for looking at Russia, though, because in Russia's case, it's kind of gone backwards. Um, now, this comes to the question, why do countries make these different choices uh, that we just started to see? You know, some countries, like China, early on, decided we're going to create this great firewall around our country. We're going to use the most sophisticated technology we can throw at it, use both manual and automated systems to block and censor and filter for keywords, and um, do so as effectively as we can from as early on as possible because we don't want this to get out of hand. Russia, on the other hand, you saw the blogosphere map. Um, things are already out of hand. and. Um, there's been a lot of different choices made by states. And so the question is, you know, why are states that are in some cases relatively similar in how they regulate uh, society offline making different choices in how they regulate the internet? And um, I, I'd argue that there are three sort of levels you have to look at to try to understand this as a sort of 
by the way, the dictator's dilemma on the last slide comes from Sam Huntington's. I, I wasn't calling every country that we, we've been talking about a dictatorship. It's more, uh, this is a term that's been coined uh, for discussing it as a decision game. Um, why do, is it sort of game theoretic. Why do countries choose this way or this way based on thinking about different pressures they're facing? It comes from Sam Huntington's uh, sort of classic discussion of the king's dilemma. Um, but anyway, um, so facing um, the decision of whether or not to regulate and how to regulate, states are likely to be influenced by three levels of factors. The first is the most obvious, is state level factors. Things that uh, and I'll go through these in a little bit more detail, but things that are specific to that country, characteristics of it. But then there's also things like interdependencies between states. Um, what region is the state in? What's its position in the international system? What pressures, what coercive forces, what forms of cooperation is it subject to? And then there's a third thing, which is exogenous things that are happening globally, global trends. Things like the Arab Spring, for example. Come through these quickly. Um, the state level characteristics probably is still the, the most significant to get a handle on because it's important to see that this is di states differ in the approaches they're taking. Um, so one of the things which is obvious is states are likely to regulate the internet in a way which seems to parallel somehow the way they regulate society overall. The way in which they restrict or don't restrict civil liberties, things like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of association, the media, the press, um, you're going to see some parallels like that between that online, the, the way they do that online and the way they've been doing it offline. Um, but that doesn't explain everything. And um, the level of internet penetration is likely to also play a significant role. If you have 1% internet penetration, it's hardly worth your time to pay attention. But if you have 50%, then your eyes are wide open. Um, protest levels. If everything seems to be going well and nobody seems to be expressing any grievance recently in your country, then you're not likely to be that worried. Um, however, if you've seen lots of instability even before the internet, and now as penetration rates are rising, you're seeing more, then you're likely to be worried. And uh, so these things can work together to make a regime more likely to be concerned about how to regulate the internet. And this can be the case anywhere. You've seen this effort to create more regulations of the internet in England in, or in the UK in the last few years in result of the riots that took place in 2011 then where people were using blackberries. Um, so this kind of reactionary thinking. Um, these things are also important. How legitimate is it going to look if you regulate in certain ways the internet? Now, if I am China, um, or if I'm Saudi Arabia, maybe for different reasons, I might not be that concerned about the legitimacy costs of implementing some sort of restrictions on access. Um, now, this can be both international and domestic. Maybe I care about the uh, domestic effects and whether it's seen as legitimate, but if I give people some way to communicate and interact, like in China where you have all sorts of alternative platforms that have developed, maybe that won't be that burdensome. But in Saudi Arabia, for example, it's a lot of the regulation is justified in terms of protecting the religion and protecting uh, people from uh, content like pornography and content that makes fun of the religion and things like this. You actually have a portal in Saudi Arabia that is set up so people can suggest sites to block or unblock. So there's a lot more sort of transparency about what they're doing than there is in some other countries. Um, economic costs and benefits. Am I afraid that if I crack down on the, on the internet in various ways that block sites that everyone needs for work, that's going to really diminish the development of my ICT sector, my information communication technology sector, so, and that's going to hurt my economy. Or, on the other hand, do I think if I do something that gets foreign companies to leave, it's actually going to help the domestic companies to grow up to take their place? That might have something to do with how large my domestic market for these things is. If you're Kazakhstan and you have a population of 17 million people, you might not have enough people to make homegrown platforms viable. Or maybe you do, actually. Um, technical restriction capacity. 
as a country, if you are very developed and you have a lot of human capital in the technology sector, you're more likely to be able to implement sophisticated, uh, specific to your country sorts of blocks and uh, different systems. Whereas if you're an underdeveloped country that is concerned about the effects these technologies are having, but doesn't have a lot of manpower for, or technical capacity or money to throw at it, you might just buy whatever technology is out there from, in some cases, a Western company um, and implement it in your country without a lot of tailoring for your country. Um, now, in terms of the international and regional interdependencies, uh, these are things like policy diffusion across regions, um, learning from looking at other states, exemplary examples of states like China or like Uzbekistan in the Central Asian region, where things have been done a certain way, or like Russia. Um, one of my uh, interview subjects in Kazakhstan last summer said to me that, well, the NGO law in Russia will of course get the same here. We get everything that happens in Russia. Um, so you have this kind of learning within regions, and you see a sort of cluster effect that develops within regions. Um, and you also have differences in how vulnerable are certain states to international pressure, and how likely are they to be subjected to it. Now, one of the things that I find remarkable in the U.S. is you hear a lot about Russia, but you never hear anything about Turkmenistan. Uh, um, and, I mean, it's just certain countries, there's no attention from other countries because they're not involved in them. They're not involved with them in any way. Other countries, they care a lot about what happens because they have business investments there or things like that. And so that can make a difference in terms of how vulnerable the regime is or how much pressure it's going to be under. Also, if you're a natural resource rich state, maybe you don't need Western investments in your, in your country. On the other hand, if you're really dependent on your relationship with the U.S., like Kazakhstan is, maybe you care, but maybe the U.S. has other reasons to not care so much because it cares too. Like, um, anyway, I won't get into that. But, um, so, then you have these global trends that on top of, you think of this as sort of a layer cake. You have the state level factors, you have these regional level factors that are influencing every state in that region because of these interdependencies, and then you have um, global trends on top of that that can shake things up, and this is why I discuss this as a norm adoption dynamic. It, you, have, you can have sort of cascade effects where internationally more states are starting to restrict the internet in certain ways so it becomes more acceptable. Or, where there's a lot of discussion of internet freedom, and suddenly everyone's like, oh, our internet's totally free. And um, so, things like how much internet penetration is there internationally can start to make uh, the global discourse focus more on how are people regulating it. Um, changes in the infrastructure can affect uh, regulation in particular countries. Sometimes you have discussion of downstream regulations where one country has a filter in place and all the internet traffic that goes to the next country ends up being filtered as a result. Um, the Arab Spring is a really important one here. Um, and, I mean, the spill movement in Russia could be, in this region, probably even more important. But internationally, the Arab Spring was so widely noted and it was sort of a first of its kind in terms of the level and magnitude and regional diversity of the movements. And everyone was talking about the role of the internet in them. So I think there's been a lot of backlash by states being worried about having an Arab Spring of their own, so to speak. Um, and so thinking about how you could put these factors together, looking at this digital dictator's dilemma puzzle as a game theoretic, you know, how to how do they decide? Uh, this is a uh, heuristic, it's, uh, but I've created a typology just looking at the state level characteristics, which still today are probably the most important. Um, if you, um, so I picked the first three from the list I gave you, which I think are likely to, in combination, be the most significant. The others will tweak what the, what the final decisions of details are, but what type of regime is it? in terms of how it regulates its society offline or before the internet, in the absence of the internet. Um, how high is internet penetration? And how high have recent protest levels been? If you think about just those three things, you can get a pretty good picture of what you might expect a sort of range of options to be for a country. 
Now I've circled the hybrid regimes with high, and I've included this, I won't go through the whole thing in detail here, but I've included it in the handout. Um, I've circled the hybrid regimes with high, um, or with high internet penetration. And the reason I've circled that is I think that those are particularly interesting and liminal, a sort of you don't quite know what to think is going to happen category. The others are more predictive. Um, authoritarian regimes, and I'm using this dichotomy of hybrid versus authoritarian, which is a loose dichotomy, but basically you have some countries which are clearly not making any show of being democracies. They're not electoral democracies. They don't have elected officials. They, Or if they do, it's so completely obviously uneven and rigged and that there's really no pretense about it. And they don't care. Um, the most closed regimes. But then you have countries which I would say Russia falls into this category. Some would debate me on that, but I would still put it there, where they care about the legitimacy of having elections, of seeming like a democracy, and there's some degree of civil liberties protected offline. All of these things seem to be by some sort of elements of rule of law. It's not perfect remotely, but it's a far away from the most extreme of this. And as a result, legitimacy is at stake both domestically and internationally. If you start uh, doing things which seem to completely violate standards of democracy, and insofar as internet freedom has emerged as a norm of democracy, then you start having this as an issue where uh, states here which have high internet penetration, especially those with high protest, are going to be in a bind. Because on the one hand, they have the pressure that they're really worried about the effects on domestic stability. On the other hand, they are worried about the legitimacy costs of cracking down in obvious ways. And arguably this might be part of the reason that Russia for so long has been an exemplar of the next generation methods that are less obvious. And um, so these are the, the, for me, perhaps the most interesting cases to watch. Um, here you have a first cut at looking at this with some data. And, um, the data I'm using here, and this is sort of fuzzy, I apologize for that, is the internet filtering level. Now this is first generation, this is the, the most obvious first generation. How, how old is it? Uh, since things change fast. Okay, yes. This, this is a good question. So there is a pr chronic problem with this, with, um, and I'm in the process of working on figuring out a better solution. He, for this, I'm using the Open Net Initiative data from the Berkman Center and University of Toronto. This data is from 2011. However, um, some of the data is more recent and some of it less recent in terms of when they actually took the measurements. So it is not perfect. And um, I, I'm actually actively trying to get my hands on something that is more, more perfect, more accurate. Yeah. Russia got some extra position stores, you know, closer to Iran. Well, no, not quite, but in this direction. Well, no, okay, so I should say, this goes at least a while ago. This is not, this is like from a couple of years ago, which is when this data set is from. Well, how, um, how do they come up with their measurements? They actually, um, they use an automated software which tests... Um, automated software to, to measure freedom? Liberty, liberty. Sorry, yeah, I didn't finish explaining the variables. No, this is good. Uh, so, the... the the um, x-axis is, I, I have to ask forgiveness before I use this data because it's the only data I have in my hands which does anything like this, but it's terrible. It's the Freedom House, which is an NGO in the US, Freedom House Freedom in the World data on civil liberties. And they measure civil liberties restrictions. They also do, uh, do a measure of political rights restrictions. Um, seven being the highest score. So the countries with the highest score have the most restrictions. Um, and the countries with the lowest score have the lowest restrictions. I'm very cynical myself about this data. The US always scores one on both axes. Uh, and I, I find this, you know, it's, it's very political itself. But it, it provides some heuristic at least. It's, it's not perfect. Um, but the civil liberties data is interesting because it gets at things like civil society, freedom, freedom of expression and media, things like that. It's not just about elections. And on that, um, the way they do their categories, Russia is classified as partly free. Um, if you look at their political rights, they classify Russia as not free. 
but um, here I'm using the civil liberties score. So uh, you see that there, there are some countries that are all the way over here within the FSC region, the former Soviet region, like Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Belarus. Russia is a little further to the left. So is Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to point out with this is that um, it, it verifies what I was arguing before, that regime type is not the only thing you need to look at in order to predict what the level of restriction is going to be. Um, this is looking just at filtering. It's not looking at attacks on bloggers. It's not looking at things like surveillance. So there are other things going on here that aren't in this picture. But in terms of the block, outright blocking and filtering of sites, you have, a, um, instead of having a perfect correlation that falls along the line where you have the offline regime type is perfectly replicated by the online regime type. Instead, it falls under the line. It's a set theoretic relationship. It's like uh, if you're the most restrictive countries offline, you may filter the internet the most, or you may not filter it at all. You have this whole range. And that's really interesting, because what it means is you have asymmetry. You have some countries down here in this corner that have relatively low levels of restriction of the internet relative to their levels of restriction of offline civil liberties. Now, the next obvious question would be, any, any guesses? Remembering the list of variables? I'm not sure about the obvious question, but it might, uh, the, your explanation might, you know, have different, this, actually, maybe these different levels are uh, defined in a way that this category 2 is simply not really well, you know, explained, or maybe, well, if you remove, say, one category, the plot will look different, right? And countries will fall down into different sets. So maybe there is this tendency. If you remove one as, as you just suggested, that some yeah. filter everything, some do not filter at all. Or maybe they shouldn't be just uh, one, two, three, four levels, but just two levels, and then, uh, well, these levels might be defined in a different way. Okay. Just, yeah, no, that's it, fair. Since you have these, you know, fixed levels, not some numbers or scores. Actually, let me explain. It makes it important how you define each of them. Yeah. Let me explain um, how I defined this variable because uh, the ONI data has a four-part index, uh, and I averaged the four parts. So their their four parts are uh, for political material content um, for social content, things like uh, um, gay rights, or um, I'd have to think for a second, uh, but um, I think pornography maybe. Um, then the uh, third part is um, tools for, actually I think it's a three part index, sorry. Uh, tools for bypassing uh, censorship. So things like VPNs or uh, Tor, uh, anonymizing engines. Do they block those sorts of tools? And so they, they rate each of these things, and I, I averaged those indexes. Um, I didn't see a lot of huge differentiation in terms of um, which, which things were filtered um, that seemed to really impact the picture. As I recall, I, I did this graph with a couple of the different indexes to see if it looked really different. but. Um, I don't know if that answers a little bit um, part of the question, but um, you're right. There's all different ways that you can measure this. Um, but but the, the larger point I'm making here is that you see, um, you see some variation amongst countries which seem to have similar regime type in terms of how they restrict offline civil liberties, but they do different things with their internet. And um, you see some regional clusters also. So up here you see the GCC region, the Gulf Commonwealth, the Gulf Commonwealth Confederation. Oh, Gulf, what does GCC stand for? Uh, the, basically Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, all, uh, the UAE, um, these countries in the Gulf region um, all filter their internet at about the highest level. Um, and yet they vary in terms of their regime type somewhat. Um, 
because this is just looking at civil liberties, you don't see the variation as much from side to side, but if you look at political rights, you see more variation. Kuwait being designated as an electoral democracy, and yet they filter the internet just as much, almost, as Saudi Arabia does. Um, and you see the, the um, former Soviet region, you have a bit of a cluster in the lower range, which is interesting to observe. Here. Now, this is from a few years ago. This is from a couple of years ago, at least, in this data. And that's interesting because there's been a trend in the other direction recently. Um, but this shows um, the online versus offline line. The, the, this basically replicates the data you just saw, but show, shows that the while there is a correlation that is significant, it, the R squared doesn't really make enough of an explanation. Even, and it's pretty robust if you use the civil liberties, the political rights, or the combined index of those two. Um, this is a different graph showing the levels of filtering compared to internet penetration. Um, if you, you might expect that you would have one trend. As internet penetration increases, countries are more likely to restrict the internet. You know, the UK is concerned about what was used for the London riots. You have um, a variety of different ways in which some of the Western democracies have expressed a lot of concern on the way, about the way the internet has been used. But overall, you see instead a sort of bifurcated trend. If you, do, if you create the best fit regression line for the states that are classified by the Freedom House data as not free and those that are classified as, as free, you see the two lines go in opposite directions. Um, if you look at the states that are partly free, there's no significant relationship. And those states contain most of the hybrid regimes. And they're sort of in this range here, the, the black on the graph. And this is interesting because uh, with the one weird exception of South Korea, um, it seems like as states that are democracies get more internet penetration, they're more likely con to conform to the norm amongst democracies and stop filtering if they have been filtering or not filter their internet. Whereas as states get higher internet penetration, they seem to be more likely if they're non-democracies to say, okay, the heck with this not filtering our internet, we're going to start now because this is bad news uh, or something along those lines. Um, so the real question here that emerges is what's going to happen to all the states that have been hybrid regimes, that have been pseudo-democracies, and that haven't had as high an internet penetration yet as they progress to higher levels of internet penetration. This is not a longitudinal data set here. This is one snapshot picture. So what you need to see is what happens five, ten years later to the countries that are here in this picture. Um, and this, again, shows the regression uh, that those lines showed, that um, you have a significant negative slope for the free countries, significant positive slope for the not free countries, and no significant relationship for the partly free countries. Um, this is to make your eyeballs spin or something, um, but I gave you this in the handout. And, um, the only thing that I'm trying to get at here is to show that this isn't the whole picture. The international and regional factors, again, also come into play. And uh, if you try to take the typology that I, I showed first, which was just for this part, and take in addition to that the way in which international factors, which to having restrictive peers in your neighborhood, being part of a restrictive neighborhood, or being subject to a lot of international pressure might influence things, you see that there's a fairly wide range of possible outcomes. Now, this is my guess. This is theory. This isn't, this isn't something I've verified yet. But I, I would venture to guess that you're going to have a fairly wide range of possible outcomes for these hybrid regime states, for example, depending on how much pressure is put on them, depending on what neighborhood they're in, and maybe other factors, too. Um, this shows the same graph from before with internet penetration levels um, and just showing the regional dynamic again. Um, again, you see the GCC states are sort of leading the charge. Mm -hmm. May I interrupt you for a moment, Lassie? Do I understand it correctly that all this second part of the table with all types of hybrid regimes, most likely they have either low or very low possibility, probability of including 
place restricted policy, right? Is it correct? What I got out of like, that they're most likely low or very low possibility? No, I wouldn't say that they're most likely low or very low possibility. But, okay, maybe, maybe can you explain that what one single line means? Uh, so if I sure. have high ICT penetration and the uh, recent progress level is relatively high, then... Uh, so if you have, if you're this guy here, you have a, you're a hybrid regime, you have high internet penetration, you have a high recent protest level, and you are in a restrictive neighborhood where the countries that are your nearest neighbors or, or you have peers that are the countries you associate with the most are all restricting their internet or a lot of them are and you're subject to very little international pressure because you're a big powerful state maybe or because you're oil rich something that makes you able to stand on your own feet or because the other countries aren't paying that much attention to what happens um, then you're uh, at a medium to high likelihood to restrict. The medium part being because there's still this, you're a hybrid regime, you're concerned about what the effects are going to be on legitimacy, but all these other factors are lined up to make you feel this pressure. Now, the other thing about hybrid regimes here is I think they're the hardest to predict. And so, you know, I can venture this guess, but I think it's, it's an... Um, emergent phenomena in some ways. These ones are the most important, perhaps, and I'll get to that in a second. What happens with these states could decide the fate of a lot of other states in terms of the international norm, because they're the ones where it's up in the air. They're the ones in that previous picture where everyone's going one way or the other, where it's not sure which way they go. But if they all go that way, then the but international norm why is changing. I was just noticing that out of, say, six combinations, we have only one is possibility of high possibility of putting this uh, restricted policy in place and like three or four have medium everything else goes to low or very low which seems I don't know how many countries fall into first category and all other categories but it seems like perspective is good in general because it's very unlikely that hybrid regime will put in place some very restrictive policy is it correct um Perhaps, perhaps, at least as long as, I mean, you have to take into account that here you're looking at all the ones where internet penetration is very low. And that's not likely to stay the case for very long. And so as internet penetration increases, they move into one of these two. And so then you get this sort of uh, cascade effect possibility, where the ones which already had high internet penetration have adopted these policies. and. Yeah, so it's, it's up in the air to some extent, whether that's really a good thing, but... Um, this... Oh, I know what I wanted to... Show. Okay, so here I'm talking about the regional um, clustering, and um, you see the FSU region also has been something of a... has constituted something of a regional cluster. Um, at relatively low penetration levels. This is from a couple of years ago. Russia now has internet penetration up around 50%. Um, so every country has moved to some extent this way, and some of the countries here have moved to some extent this way as well. Um, but it's interesting that this snapshot, which really is relevant because it's right before the protest movement started emerging, both the Arab Spring movements and the movements in Russia, um, you had countries in the former Soviet region were sort of uh, clustered in this medium internet penetration, um, globally speaking, but relatively low filtering um, sort of region, as opposed to some other obvious uh, regional clusters. Um, now, if you take account of countries which have internet penetration greater than 15%, so we've gotten rid of the countries which just are totally undeveloped and nobody's using the internet. Um, then you look at the ways in which different regions, um, the, the ways in which uh, the relationship between internet filtering and regime type in different regions, you see that the extent to which a uh, regime is likely to filter increases with an increase in offline restrictions differs across regions. Now, this is probably not the best way to measure these regional clusters, but it's 
the first way I've come up with, and I'll, I'm working on other techniques. Um, however, you do see a significant difference between the Middle East and North Africa region and the former Soviet region. And you see some difference that's not significant, so I don't know to what extent it's worth putting up there. The number of data points is too small, but uh, with the East Asia region. But you see this in the graph also, that these regions differ. And so I'll show you a graph which shows this more obviously, more intuitively. Um, the, as the level of offline civil liberties restrictions increases within the FSU region, this red line, uh, for per unit increase in civil liberties restriction, there's less of an increase in the level of internet filtering restriction. And um, this is different than the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa, the black line, or East Asia, the pink line, where you see much more significant increase in the level of filtering for countries that are more restrictive offline. So it seems to speak to some sort of regional norm of what is normal within a region. Um, th this is um, a first cut at this. I, I, I would if, okay, based on the region, if Israel and Amman fall into the same category, you know, I would consider them still like countries from different regions, even they're kind of close to each other. It just depends how you draw this line. But oh, of course, right. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think I tried that with Israel out, and it didn't make a significant difference. But maybe I'm, maybe I didn't, and if I didn't, then I apologize. Also, um, I, if I didn't notice that, then that was my. Anyway, um, big takeaways from this: policy linkage alone doesn't explain policy linkage being this offline and online regime. The, using similar methods to regulate the two. It doesn't explain everything. You have this huge variation in the policies being adopted by countries that seem to be somewhat similar in the offline regime type. Internet penetration level alone doesn't explain everything either. And uh, in fact, seems to have this interesting bimodal relationship with uh, the different, um, depending on regime type. So, but even if you take account of those two, it doesn't explain everything. There's uh, significant, uh, role of domestic instability and of regional um, norms in terms of affecting what policy states adopt. Um, and so questions that come out of this is, are we to expect some sort of regional divergence, I mean not, re sorry, some sort of policy divergence internationally in terms of uh, internet regulation? Um, and what's going to happen to countries which have fallen into this middle category, hybrid regimes? Are, um, it's been a new phenomenon since the 90s, having regimes which are democracies on some level, but not perfect, as opposed to the Cold War days where you had this complete division of uh, democracies and non-democracies. And some would say that there's some ways in which it's preferable to have countries which are at least somewhat democratic. But if you have this movement towards hybrid regimes moving towards giving up on that because they can't maintain that and maintain stability, then what happens next? It raises some interesting questions for the future. Um, and for this reason, I think Russia's a really interesting case because it's been an exemplar of this type of hybrid regime that has pioneered these sorts of next generation approaches. And it's also um, a large pivotal country in its region and internationally that is likely to be looked to by other countries as an example. Um, and so here you have um, people protesting the uh, blacklist law and uh, black site, uh, sites going black in reaction and protest. Um, this is just showing some of the regional diversity and you can see that Russia is interesting in that it falls into this less uh, symmetric category. Uh, you have countries which are at this point, when this data is from, so a couple of years ago, their level of filtering and their level of restriction offline were somewhat in parallel with each other. Um, at one extreme and at the other extreme. And then you have some countries which were more asymmetric. And um, Tajikistan has relatively low internet penetration. So that's a less interesting case, but, but these cases are pretty interesting. So it's, it's mm -hmm. a bit of a news for us. It's about what, what, what sites have been blocked? Because we sort of don't notice. What, 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 what kind of 
Because they've been trying to. Yeah, they were like, yeah. Is it it's just, can you can you give us example? Can you a little bit to worry, like yeah, how, what actually they did, did in Dortmund Center? Because it's like, especially like in 2011, I really don't understand what was filtering in Russia. Well, we, we haven't. No, we haven't any, noticed any, any filtering. We haven't noticed. So like you're asking. Well, yes. well, you read the news, you notice it, but like when you try right. to actually find something, no, I, I never ever ended up in this picture unless oh, I was sorry. given specifically a link. Well, I mean, not not this one was like in protest. I, yeah, well, okay. I mean, I mean the official link when it's like blocked. Uh, I only did like I saw this picture only once when they closed one side for like one day, and it was like a huge. Like, it was almost. No, like it, so, what was the methodology like? Well, the Berkman um, Center, not the blogosphere map, but the, yeah, the, the, the ONI data. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, um, this is really low. This is showing almost no evidence of filtering um, in this square here. Um, versus, this is out on a four point scale, where four is there's some sort of significant measure filtering, three. Uh, and pervasive filtering, I think, is the way they categorize four. Versus three, it's there's significant systemic filtering, but maybe not as much. Two, there's some filtering. One, there's maybe some filtering, but they're not really sure there's any. So um, it's pretty much um, at one of the lowest levels it can be at. Um, now, the way they measure it is they, they have a software that they implement they implement within the country that um, creates as I understand this a VPN link with the lab in the University of Toronto and simultaneously tests a long list of sites that have been created uh, some sites within the country and some sites internationally uh, in each of the categories uh, simultaneously testing them from the ISP in the country and from the ISP in the University of Toronto which they know is not filtered uh, so they need that as a control so that it is, they know that it's not just that the site is temporarily down for some other reason. And they do this several, if a site comes up as being blocked, then they retest it several times over the course of a period of a couple of days or something like this. Um, I, I, I believe that's how it works. And so they, um, they usually have a list of, uh, I think, upwards of a thousand sites that they're looking at in different categories. And across countries so that it isn't just idiosyncratic by country, they, um, they have a list which is universal, which they use as their list of international sites. And then they have a country-specific list that they have people who are familiar with the politics and the uh, society in the country uh, code as being falling into one of those four categories. Does that make sense? What we're saying is that none of us being pretty active internet users, right. plus not me, not Ruben, anybody in this room have ever encountered a, a blog yes, site? Yes, which yes, so I'm kind of, I'm sorry, can I just... Yeah, of course. Five minutes, so I'm kind of surprised with the question actually, because I have like plenty of sites who yes. were really blocked. Yeah. Really blocked by political... Yes, of course, yeah, first of all, yeah. well, when you say that by political means, you need to consider that there are some sites, like for example, demotivation, who, who then became demotivation org, and then demotivation, demotivation me. Was blocked. Yeah, yeah, it was blocked, and that was a huge scandal about the blocking of demotivation site, because there were some pictures, you know, demotivational pictures, with like Vladimir Putin and somebody else, and they were blocked, and mm -hmm. then they make like uh, automatic forwarding from the room server to org, then to me, then to something else, else, then again to me. So now they have like different surveys that uh, like make, make this automatic uh, things to do. And then you need to consider also online libraries. Uh, some of them were also com like collecting some uh, forbidden files and forbidden books, and then they were blocked. And then now oh, oh, they you it on Sweden or some summer like that. Do you mean what, 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 like my book library? What, no, like? no, no, like... Uh, for political I, I reasons or for copyright yeah, reasons? No, not for, for political reasons. Of course, not. For copyright reasons you can, you know, close any library in the internet. Yeah. But that was exactly for political reasons. So these libraries, uh, they were including some books which were like in the federal register of forbidden books, like yet yeah, from extremist stuff, like, oh, uh, somebody like Hitler, or, you know, some of the leaders uh, from Italy or Spain, like they uh, wrote this book 80 years ago, and now because of this book, all society was blocked. 
So the story was like that. So there were really ma many sites, but the scandals in Facebook and Conduct, they were so, you know, huge, like, oh, they, they closed in the sites. So sometimes it was like a feedback from the blogosphere to Kremlin, and the Kremlin decided not to close the sites. So sometimes there's a story like that. It's really interesting, thanks. Uh, and my answer was going to be, well, that's what I'm here to study. Um, and I don't know yet, but I, I've read that there is now a new list of 248 sites that just was reported by Roskomnadzar Tsar uh, this week. And, you know, but I don't know. I, I haven't been here until this week or two weeks ago, so I'm just starting to uh, become familiar with what the actual experience of the new Internet blacklist law is. Um, and to what extent, and to see to what extent it actually is just for pornography and copyright, or to what extent it's something more than that. Um, now, the example you gave, oh, what's your name? Yeah. Ira. The example Ira gave of um, blocking a whole site because of one book is interesting because that's one of the things which you know is a nuance that's important here. Um, you sometimes have sophisticated blocking schemes where intentionally a uh, country decides to block a particular piece of a site, but if they don't have the technology to do that available to them readily, or because they want to use it as an excuse to block the whole site, they can instead just block the whole domain. And that um, that's becoming a sort of more politicized issue. I was just talking to somebody at the EFF recently who was telling me that um, that they're trying to pressure some of the major Western internet companies into using HTTPS more so that it makes it harder for, uh, for to use the technology that would go through and, and um, block specific pieces. Um, but then you have situations like what happened in Kazakhstan over the last um, four or five years off and on each of the major blogging, sort of Russian language blogging platforms, particularly Live Journal, had been blocked. And the reason that everyone I spoke to, except for people who were really hardcore state supporters, told me the reason Live Journal had been blocked was that the son-in-law, uh, the former son-in-law, I should say, of Nazarbayev, had written a blog in which he basically talked about all sorts of things that weren't very pretty about the ruling family. And as a result, the whole live journal platform was blocked. Um, so you had, and the country, the government said, "Oh, we have no idea why people can't get live journal. It must be a technical issue." Um, so um, your question was, remind me again, did I answer it? Uh, or? Sort of. So when we talk about filtering, we, we, are we are we talking about just, um, some sort of political filtering or any filtering? <laughs> This is like my question also to the like both like this was a question to this uh, Y scale. Now the question goes to X again as well. I like, just when you were talking about the theory, uh -huh. it was all about political issues. Right. So, but when you start showing data and like you go from political issues to also like things that are like not really political, like gay and lesbian movements. Well, I wouldn't, uh, I guess I've uh, tended uh, to talk about it from a perspective of political angles, being a political scientist, but I, um, in terms of the protest movements, you're not just seeing political protests, you're seeing protests about social issues as well. Um, I mean, in Russia, before the emergence of the snow movement, you had, um, you had a number of smaller movements that had to do with environmental issues, that had to do with uh, more local issues, and um, weren't necessarily explicitly political. Um, and so that's why, I mean, I included the um, civil liberties indicator, which includes things that have to do with non-political issues on the, the X scale. And on the Y scale, I included all of the different types of filtering. It would be possible to rerun the same data just using uh, political rights and political filtering. But I honestly think it's in some ways more interesting to see the bigger picture, which has to do with sort of civil society and uh, protest movements that might not be aimed at changing the regime, but might be aimed at just changing the way in which certain people or minority groups or, or local issues are dealt with. Changing state society relations in some way which isn't just explicitly political. Does that make sense? A little? And I mean, I welcome all of this, uh, you know, agnosticism as to my methods or data because I'm 
in the middle of and beginning of various aspects of this research, and so I, I welcome all the criticism I can take and you know do with it what I can. So uh, just try to understand the theory, I and mean, it's like it's uh, in which way like the, the, the reasoning goes. Like, I mean, it, 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 it's more clear, it's, to me at least, it's clearer story when like you have political regimes that are different, and then for strategic reasons they are playing they choosing this this uh, regulation for offline liberties, this regulation for online. When we talk about like uh, I don't know, other social issues. It can be like I don't. There, it's much harder for me to understand you know, like what the, what is the theory behind it. Why? Like, is it like really like a choice of political issues, or just the whole like culture of society is that it's much more restrictive in all senses of this world. Like Muslim societies, they will be re like they will be re restricted much more restricted not for political reasons. I mean, they, they're just more restrictive culture. Right. Yeah. Uh, and this is a completely different sto uh, story. I mean, like the the theory is different. I mean, so I'm trying to understand which, like, how how general is it? <laughs> like, like your theory of which, which which predictions kind of go in the political domain, which goes uh, in uh, from political regime towards the regulation. Uh, but just well, I guess um, in terms of predicting the ways in which different regimes relate to the internet and regulate it. I think you need to take account of things which are, as you said, more social norms or cultural norms, because whether you're, whether that's the reason or not, um, restricting access to social materials online, to materials like gay and lesbian rights materials online, for example, becomes a political issue, as we've seen recently in Russia and in sort of. Russia-U.S. relations. This can, even if it's seen as a social issue within a, one society, the internet being this international phenomenon, it becomes politicized sometimes. And so I think it's important to differentiate what you're looking at. And you know, if if I were going into more depth talking about the Arab states uh, or the Muslim states and the GCC states in particular, um, that would be one issue to really drill down on: is what is being blocked. Is it just things that have to do with religion? Or is it things which are political in nature also? Um, I, I haven't followed all of those cases as closely as I followed the FSU region, but I know that there was a case this past year in, uh, or two years ago, in Qatar of a poet who wrote a poem online criticizing the emir being put in prison. Um, and the site being taken down. And uh, it actually surprised me because living in Qatar, it feels like a place where civil liberties are less restricted than, than that. And yeah, so uh, there's some interesting things to look at there in terms of nuance. Um, one of the things which I, I think is interesting to take into account here is the extent to which this isn't just all about things like the snow movement. Uh, it isn't just all about large movements. It's also about small local movements, about local issues. So like environmentalism, this was one of the movements I learned about while I was in Kazakhstan that had been relatively more successful in having some inroads with the local government discussing, can we protect this reserve that a business is trying to build a ski resort there? Um, and using online mobilizing to get people to come to protest events. Um, environmental activism, uh, flash mobs, and things like this. Um, so, you know, some of these things that can transform gradually the political culture and the relations between state and society might not be the things that happen at that highest level of mass political movements around elections. Um, uh, I think this was a couple of online movements around protecting internet freedom in re retaliation of a uh, law that had been passed recently that created that treated all of the internet in Kazakhstan as if it were uh, media and put it under the same sorts of level of restriction. Um, neither movement was successful, but um, some of these show at least some sort of transformation, but I'd say that there's a fair degree of difference between a country in which you've had the blogosphere completely cut off from the Russian language blogosphere in the whole region, and as a result, you have much more limited political discourse online compared to in Russia. Um, and so, coming out of all this, I guess one of the there are a few big questions that emerge in terms of the future of the use of the internet for protest. The first question I started with. Um, and 
there, there's some trends we see going on globally right now that seem to be important, but it's not quite, they conflict with each other. You have this promotion of internet freedom that seems to be sometimes just for political purposes or sort of, pro, sort of um, problematic in various ways, hypocritical. Uh, you have the um, growing restrictions in a lot of countries. And um, that includes the restrictions of copyright as well, which can be seen as a restriction of some sort of free speech, although that's something that tends to happen more in Western democracies as well. Um, you have the role, the intervening roles of companies that are um, sometimes playing really troubling roles as middlemen in, in uh, non-democratic settings, agreeing to restrict certain material or implement block lists or selling security um, software that allows governments to do that. Um, and you have an overall increase in state control. Um, and um, I sort of, I wanted to end with this comment that I heard from a kid I was talking to in Astana last year who, who said to me when I asked about the political blogosphere in Kazakhstan and if there were any political bloggers it was worth reading, who did he read, he responds to me, well, you have to understand. Now, you have to understand first, I hadn't said anything about Russia or Navalny. But it turns to me and says, well, you have to understand, in Kazakhstan we couldn't have a blogger like Navalny. And I thought this was really interesting for several reasons. Uh, you know, first I asked him why, and he went on to explain people are a little bit afraid to discuss politics online, people aren't as engaged. But then the other thing was, um, the fact that he brought it up showed that he was following what was going on in Russia. He was following the political blogosphere in Russia, which meant a lot of the time he might have had to use a VPN to do that, and he was interested in it. And so this goes to the sort of regional exemplar effect that Russia can have in the region. And um, comes back to why this is a really important country, besides the fact that everyone here is living here, uh, why it's a really important country in terms of the potential effects on global norms for internet freedom. That's it. Okay, so questions. <laughs> More questions. Thank you, JK. So please, uh, whatever questions are uh, left, for the end of discussion, go on, and uh, then some other questions might be taken offline later, if you like. Yes. Sorry. Like, thank you very much. That was really exciting because I like um, I'm researching political protests, so I look at all the stuff on the lens of political protests. That is quite interesting. Uh, I have one suggestion, first of all, uh -huh. about this, you know, clusters, people were effects of different countries which is situated like near each other and they look at each other from Kazakhstan, they read Russian newspapers, Russian books and so on. Actually, like in Belarus, the situation is exactly the same because people who have real who have real restricted internet in Belarus, they try to read their news in Russian newspapers because they consider them as more liberal and they don't they have in Belarus. And uh, it's quite interesting that uh, some people from Russia, they decided to cross in Belarus, not in Russia, because comparing these two countries, they decide that it's better to help those people, not, not that one, because the situation is much worse. So perhaps in your analysis further, you can somehow you know, try to understand how these clusters, clusters, they work together. Uh -huh. It's quite interesting how this information circulation between different yeah. countries. I think that that no, it's very interesting. Like based on my empirical uh, stuff uh, in the protest movements. And my question was about the store stuff and all those anonymizers, IDP, and stuff like that. Uh, perhaps you need to perhaps uh, also add to the analysis, instead of, for example, uh, Freedom House Index, which I really hate because. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> like it's like, problematic. It? It's, it's really problematic. Yeah, but perhaps you can somehow use it like a variable the percent of people who use anonymizers or tours or IDP stuff in the country because it somehow can show us that they need these anonymizers. Of course, they can be like corner productions or those people who would like to uh, buy some crack or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Like right. you know the stuff, for example, with torrents. Like in Russia, when you try to block some torrent site, people perceive it as a political pressure because, like, 
we all have problem with democracy, that is why this very stuff was again about political stuff. And when you do it in Germany, actually, nobody cares because like, okay, they block torrent because it's all about copyright. So it's okay. You see, like Germans perceive it like copyright stuff and Russians perceive it like political stuff. And it's freedom of speech. Yeah, and freedom of speech. So that's why it's interesting. Well, you know, I, I think also the copyright stuff is perceived as freedom of speech in some Western countries too. A little less so probably. But you will see like Germany is here and Russia is here, so. You definitely see um, in during the ACTA uh, protests in uh, Europe, you saw centers of protest in Poland in particular. And I think to some extent Ukraine, where uh, people were really upset about the implementation of new copyright law, and um, it wasn't. It, it was uh, some of the analysis of this at the time was basically that people are more sensitive to it as a restriction on freedom of speech because of the regimes they've lived under and so on. So, but I mean, people in the U.S. were pretty upset by SOPA and PIPA as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, freedom of stealing, I would freedom say. Of yeah. It's more important than freedom of speech in Russia. <laughs> well, you know, it, one interesting and perhaps legitimate issue with that is um, the um, when I was in Kazakhstan, they had just passed a new copyright law, sort of like the law that's just been passed here on anti piracy. And um, they, um, one of the bloggers I spoke to said that she thought it was completely legitimate to protest because. It was no use to her to pay the same rate that people in the U.S. pay for a video, which was ridiculous given the market of prices in Kazakhstan to begin with, but, and then not be able to listen to it in her own language and not to have subtitles to it. And so the versions of it that were available for free were versions where people had added either voiceover or subtitles in Russian that then people there could understand. And it seems to me like that local language argument, when it's not been made available in the local language, is a fairly legitimate argument, even if you accept all the copyright rules and so on. Um, but yeah, other questions? Well, it, it depends. In, in German court, one of, of actually cases of this kind was turned out like the guy was watching, well, he had a TV, his TV access socket for TV. So he was supposed to pay some just monthly rent for this thing. And it's a law in Germany. And he didn't, and he explained, I don't speak German. So I don't understand a single channel out of these you know, seven channels. I said, well, you have to pay anyway. So just, you, you have an option, right? So, but yeah, in general, that's a good argument, probably. There's one more sort of neighboring domain. So one is copyright, and another what's 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 in, in, in the United States and in, in, in Europe is called hate speech. Right. Yeah, so, so some of the filter examples of filtering, which were uh, given today, uh, could have been theoretically uh, classified as hate speech. Do you have any position on hate speech? I, th I, th I think within, in the Western democracies there are uh, there are at least a few ways to deal with it. There are, let's say in the United States. The, there is no hate speech restriction as a rule, but then in quite a few European countries, the, the hate speech is filtered. Yeah. And then a lot depends on the definition of hate speech. Yeah. So a lot of people, uh, he, he, when they created those uh, hated uh, laws here about uh, so some of the restrictions of free speech, they sort of tried to model it uh, or after the American and European, basically European hate speech restrictions. So. What's, uh, what's my position on the world? Yeah, I guess. Um, well, you know, I, I guess I, I'm still figuring out what my position is on uh, how to how governments should re react to it online. Um, I, I know that internet freedom sort of. Uh, Activists in the U.S. tend to agree that there shouldn't be any restrictions um, on at least uh, maybe maybe hate speech, which is uh, advocating violence. There should be, but anything other than that, there shouldn't be. Um, I had very mixed feelings about the way that Google handled the Innocence of Muslims video, where they said that it didn't violate their policy because their policy was that it was okay to have speech which was 
insulting a religion as long as it wasn't insulting people, or something like that. And I thought that restriction, having just come from living in the Muslim world for a year, I found that restriction to be very Californian and ridiculous because um, in California, people think of religion as some sort of self-selected spirituality. Um, and so you can insult the choice I made of what, you know, but you can't, you're not insulting me. But in large portions of the world, most places, that's not the way people think of religion. They think of it as part of their identity in a deep way. And so to say it's okay to speak hate about the religion, that's not the same as speaking hate about the people who are a part of that religion, seemed to me to be a ridiculous distinction. Um, and I thought that it created more problems than it helped. I also was struck, I gave a talk at YouTube uh, a while after that happened. and. Um, I tried to get him to meet with the guy who had been, well, my contact there, I asked if, he asked me if I wanted to talk to anyone, and I said, well, who were involved in the decision on the innocence of Muslims? And he said, oh, I know that guy. Um, I'll introduce you. Turned out that guy was on a phone call at the time, so I didn't end up talking to him, but it was one guy. And the fact that this decision that had dramatic implications around the world was made by one guy struck me as exceedingly problematic, since this was clearly a decision that had enormous sort of ethical repercussions and had to do with sort of cross-cultural understanding. Anyway, my position is sort of complicated on that. I'm still figuring it out, but that's a little bit of it. Other questions? Well, it's just like the concrete one thing that you should like probably what we think about probably should be considered kind of law enforcement offline because sometimes it's like, like these crude measures of blocking some online content. It just substitutes for inability to enforce laws offline. I mean, like with uh -huh. pornography, I mean, in, in UK, you will go, just go to, to prison for uh, making like pornography, child pornography, and, and they will find you. I mean, some very famous people will talk doing this, uh, just having pornography on their computers, not even sharing it. Uh -huh. uh, whereas, like, I mean, in former Soviet Union, you probably, like, I don't think there was ever any cases of this happening. So if you want to blog it, I mean, in UK, you just you put people to prison uh, because you can do this. In, uh, and uh, in former Soviet Union, you just block all the problem. You try to block all everything. So that, there's like, uh, there are like really substitutes between offline enforcement and online enforcement. The, the worse you can enforce it offline, the more you move to cruder measures of yeah. blocking on Yeah. So, no, I mean, I, I think there's some fungibility between these. It's, it's definitely, my, my, by making it this sort of division, the last thing I want to imply is that, you know, basically the internet exists in some ethereal other sphere which is distinct from the realities of the society and government structures of that country. Anything but more by looking at it separately, you get at some sort of different different distinctions in terms of how much attention is being paid to it and how that attention is similar or different from attention to sort of offline, more real world -y phenomenon. But, I mean, obviously when you're looking at things like offline restrictions of civil liberties, you're looking at, for example, NGOs and how they're being restricted. NGOs are using the internet. Maybe NGOs are being blocked and how they use the internet. So these things are intertwined in certain ways. One of the things which I'm not sure if I completely mentioned, but I think is important is, which has to do more with the question of movements and how they use these technologies, is I think that asymmetry degree is important to look at because it can show where the sort of most explosive effects, most immediate explosive effects might occur. Because if you have a setting where there's been a lot of restriction of the ability to associate or express or free expression or information sharing, and suddenly you have this space where you can do that and it's not been restricted, then that allows these sort of dramatic changes or large movements to emerge. I personally am not sure that that's where to look for the long-term greatest gains. Even when you have things like the Arab Spring, you know, things like that, it's unclear that that leads to the greatest long-term stable uh, um, liberalization. 
and um, the smaller things might play a more significant role, the things that happen where there is more symmetry. And so maybe what we're seeing really is just a movement towards more symmetry across the board as the relationship between internet and the society it's in becomes closer related. Anyway. Uh, one very small question I have in mind. I would assume, if we consider that new media is something which comes after traditional media, right? Mm -hmm. Then if there is any data on media freedoms in general, regardless of the internet, my guess, well guess would be that policy of internet regulation would be just hoping policy of media regulation. And then if there is data of this kind, that would be nice to see. Yeah, just plotting it. Okay, all newspapers are 100% controlled by the government, or they split between two parties, or whatever. So this kind of data. The might hardest be part of that actually is to get the data on laws for the internet. I actually spent about the month before I moved here writing to everyone I could get uh, contacts for in different NGOs at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, Berkman Center, trying to get people to give me a list of international, like global internet laws, like restrictive internet laws, anything they knew. And nobody has such a list. I actually am hoping to try to construct such a list, but because there's, there's ratings like that of, um, media laws globally, but there isn't anything like that for internet laws. There's filtering data, but the actual legal environment for regulation of the internet, as far as I've been able to find, there isn't some coded data set that shows that yet. Okay, but anyway, I mean, data on media itself, just mm -hmm. comparing if these countries will show a similar picture. If you replace internet filtering with media filtering or media censorship, would it be a similar picture or would it be something totally different? I think that um, it would be somewhere between the degree of difference of what I showed and, um, and a straight correlation. I don't think it would be st strictly the same. And I mean, that's sort of what I was trying to get at with the data I had, is I think that there actually has been this lopsidedness. Now, that might just be a matter of learning and time lapse, but it has been the case for some time. When I was living in Russia in 2002, 2003, in St. Petersburg, I knew some journalists there. And uh, one of them had just left the newspaper he previously worked at, which had been under all sorts of pressure, and started an online news poll. And his comment was, well, it's the last unrestricted place to write real news. And um, yes, the laws have caught up now, but they didn't right away. That was 10 years ago, and it's been only over the last few years that the laws have caught up. And so, and, and the laws have caught up, but the reality hasn't in terms of what's really, you know, the extent to which people's ability to uh, share information and news find news information online is still much greater than it is offline. Um, so I think, I think in terms of the laws, though, you have a time lapse. And that time lapse has happened more quickly in some places and more slowly in other places. And you have to look at other variables to see why, you know, why countries have taken forever to get around to implementing the same media laws online as offline, or why they did it so immediately. Does that make sense? Well, and part of it I might just be attention. It's, it's very hard to get this data, but of I just course. believe that there were a lot more studies on media freedom before, and that could be somehow used. Anyway, uh, yeah, there's no clear if you want to be comfortable asking questions in Russian, Jack is very bad at speaking Russian, so... Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then I think that was it. Uh, Jackie, thanks. Thank you for coming. And uh, all other questions can be taken offline. And, you all have uh, my email, I think, right. if you got and, one of the uh, handouts. Um, I think there is at least one interesting collaboration. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh,